Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Trump revives familiar Washington debate on video game violence. President Donald Trump's White House meeting Thursday about the interplay between video games and real-world violence will revisit territory already well-trodden by politicians over the decades, including his old foe Hillary Clinton. Trump is turning the spotlight to video games as part of his attempt to focus attention on mental health after last month's mass shooting in Parkland, Florida but more than a decade ago, it was former New York Senator Hillary Clinton waging the crusade against what she called the corrosive effect that violent games could be having on children's mental states. I think we should do everything we can to make sure that parents have a defense against violent and graphic video games and other content that goes against the values they're trying to instill in their children," Clinton said in 2005, shortly before introducing a bill to tighten restrictions on selling games to minors. Lawmakers first raised concerns in the 1990s that violent, and increasingly realistic, Video games not only glorify gore but desensitize players to its consequences. The debate tends to flare up in the wake of national gun tragedies, such as the 1999 mass shooting at Columbine High School in Colorado and last month's killings in Florida. A former neighbor told the Miami Herald that Parkland shooter Nicolas Cruz played video games for upwards of 15 hours per day. It was kill, 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 blow up something, and kill some more all day, the neighbor said. But the video game industry points out that violent crime has dropped since the late 1990s, even as video game sales hit record highs. And though video games are played worldwide, mass shootings are an acutely American problem, the industry's largest trade group has noted. Industry representatives will trek to the White House on Thursday so Trump can take his turn at the issue. The meeting will pit the top lobbyists and major players from the industry against fierce critics who have long pushed lawmakers to assert more control over violent content in media. Michael Gallagher, president and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association, is slated to attend, as is Robert Altman, the chairman and CEO of Zenimax Media. That company, which owns the studios behind hit video games like Doom and the Fallout series, counts Trump's brother. Robert S. Trump, among its board members. They'll face outspoken detractors like Brent Bozell, founder of the Media Research Center, and Melissa Henson, program director for the Parents Television Council, who have pointed a finger at video game makers following previous mass shootings. The ESA spends millions of dollars lobbying Washington each year on a broad swath of issues, including fighting back against efforts to regulate video game content. The truth is, there is no scientific research that validates a link between computer and video games and violence, despite lots of overheated rhetoric from the industry's detractors, ESA maintains in an online fact sheet. Yet after almost every mass shooting, at least some politicians raise the question, aren't these violent video games corrupting young people? The video games, the movies, the internet stuff is so violent. Trump told lawmakers on February 28. It's hard to believe that, at least for a percentage, and maybe it's a small percentage, of children, this doesn't have a negative impact on their thought process. Former Senator Joe Lieberman, I Connecticut, was long the face of the anti-video game crusade in Washington. In December 1993, the lawmaker called a now infamous hearing about violence and sexual abuse in gaming following the release of the fight to the death thriller Mortal Kombat. I would like to be able to pass a law saying you can't produce this stuff anymore, Lieberman said then. We don't do that because we value our freedoms, but with those rights the producers of video games in this case have also come responsibilities. Lieberman called on the video game industry to make a change. The following year, ESA established a self-regulatory body called the Entertainment Software Rating Board, which to this day scores new releases on a scale from everyone to adults only. But it's unclear whether the rating system has kept violent games out of kids' hands.
More than a decade after Lieberman's hearing, Clinton took up the issue after a Grand Theft Auto game included a hidden feature in which characters simulated sex. In 2005, she introduced the Family Entertainment Protection Act, which would have made it illegal to sell or rent mature or adult-only video games to youths under 17. Clinton's bill failed to advance, but politicians have kept the debate alive as mass shootings have continued unabated and video game technology has advanced. The two-dimensional bloodbaths of Mortal Kombat seem quaint compared to the graphic nature of some games today. High-definition graphics and immersive technologies like virtual reality allow players to feel more embedded in the action than ever before. The issue resurfaced in Washington as recently as the 2012 shooting that left 26 students and staff dead at a Newtown, Connecticut, elementary school. The National Rifle Association deflected blame to video games for instigating gun violence and industry leaders found themselves, as they do now, called in for a White House meeting. Then, it was former Vice President Joe Biden who wanted to chat. We know that there is no silver bullet to thwart mass shootings, Biden said as the meeting began. Trump tweets he's looking forward to steel meeting today. President Donald Trump wrote online Thursday that he was looking forward to a meeting with steel and aluminum industry workers but stopping short of announcing plans to implement his promised tariffs on steel and aluminum imports. Trump had reportedly been tentatively scheduled to officially impose the tariffs, for which he announced plans last week, at the 3.30 p.m. meeting, but an administration official said Wednesday that was unlikely to happen since lawyers were still finalizing paperwork for the new import taxes. Looking forward to 3.30 p.m. meeting today at the White House, the president wrote online. We have to protect and build our steel and aluminum industries while at the same time showing great flexibility and cooperation toward those that are real friends and treat us fairly on both trade and the military. The timing of Trump's official tariff announcement remained uncertain Thursday, although Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders said at Wednesday's press briefing that the White House intended to make the announcement this week. A person familiar with the internal administration debate on the tariffs said that specifics were still being worked out as of Wednesday. Trump's announcement last week that he would move to impose a 25 percent tariff on steel imports and 10 percent on aluminum came as a surprise to some inside his administration and has created a division within the Republican Party, whose congressional leaders have expressed opposition to the president's proposal. Top U.S. trade partners including China and the European Union, have also expressed concern about the implementation of tariffs. The EU has threatened retaliatory tariffs targeting U.S. industries, especially those heavily located in presidential election swing states like Florida, Ohio, Wisconsin, and North Carolina. Trump Cohn may be a globalist, but I still like him. President Donald Trump said Thursday he suspected departing aide Gary Cohn would be back, saying the National Economic Council director may be a globalist, but I still like him. This is Gary Cohn's last meeting in the cabinet, Trump said at the beginning of the meeting, which was partly televised. He's been terrific. He may be a globalist, but I still like him. He is seriously a globalist. There's no question in his own way, but you know what, he's a nationalist. He loves our country." Cohn announced his resignation on Tuesday, after unsuccessfully urging the president not to impose steep new tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum. I have a feeling you'll be back. I don't know if I can put him in the same position though, the president said of Cohn, drawing laughter. He's not quite as strong on those tariffs. But, seriously. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank Gary. He's been great. The White House hasn't announced Cohn's replacement but said Wednesday that Trump has a number of people to choose from. Cohn, who left his post as president and chief operating officer at Goldman Sachs to join the White House in 2017, hasn't specified what his next steps will be.
some members of Trump's administration who prefer more protectionist policies have referred to their internal rivals, including Cohn, as globalists. Critics say they should stop using the term as they say it has anti-Semitic connotations. Conway dodges questions on reported Hatch Act violations. Kellyanne Conway said Thursday she had spoken to President Donald Trump about a watchdog report that found her past remarks on the Alabama special election to be in violation of federal law, but the counselor to the president declined to say whether she would face disciplinary action over the ethics breach. The president and I have spoken about this, Conway said when asked about the report on Fox News. I have not made a comment on this at all and I won't today. Conway added that she won't reveal the details of private conversations between herself and the president. Pressed on whether that meant the White House would not impose disciplinary actions against her, Conway again dodged. I didn't say that, she said. I also recognize every day, maybe I'm still there and will continue to be, I'm not there to read about myself. I'm not there to talk about me and I'm there to the service of the country that I love. The interview was Conway's first since the U.S. Office of Special Counsel released a report Tuesday that found the White House aide had violated the Hatch Act by voicing her preference for a candidate in last year's hotly contested Alabama special election Senate race. The watchdog said in a release it would submit the report to Trump for disciplinary action. The White House disputed the findings arguing Conway was merely reiterating the president's support for having more lawmakers that back his policy agenda. Kellyanne Conway did not advocate for or against the election of any particular candidate, Deputy Press Secretary Hogan Gitley said Tuesday. She simply expressed the president's obvious position that he has people in the House and Senate who support his agenda. In fact, Kellyanne's statements actually show her intention and desire to comply with the Hatch Act as she twice declined to respond to the host's specific invitation to encourage Alabamians to vote for the Republican. The ethics agency in its report found that Conway gave an implied endorsement of Alabama Republican nominee Roy Moore during a Fox News interview by advocating against his opponent, Doug Jones, who later defeated Moore for the Senate seat. During the November interview, Conway warned viewers to not be fooled by Jones. In a separate CNN interview in December, the agency said, Conway again violated federal election laws by criticizing Jones and urging viewers to back more, defending him against allegations of sexual abuse. Conway treated the controversy as a settled matter on Thursday. The White House has spoken, Conway said on Fox News. The counselor to the president added that any decisions on potential punishment for the breach would be left to the commander-in-chief. This president controls the timing and tone and content of his decision, she said. The Office of Special Counsel noted that both ethics breaches occurred after Conway received significant training on Hatch Act violations. Conway previously came under scrutiny from government watchdogs for promoting Ivanka Trump's fashion line on air. It's a wonderful line. I own some of it, Conway told Fox and Friends last year. I fully, I'm going to give a free commercial here. Go buy it today, everybody. You can find it online." Walter Schaub, then the head of the Office of Government Ethics, called Conway's remarks a clear violation. Then White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer said after the incident that Conway was counseled on the subject, but declined to comment on whether she would face punishment.